quite a lot of people admitted to quite enjoying reading it, but they didn't think it had any future in publishing. And one quite senior agent, he said to me one day, he said, my advice to you is to put this in the dustbin and write something grown up. Hi, and welcome to Write Off, a podcast about writing rejection and how people get through it. I'm Francesca Steele, a journalist and writer living in London, and writing rejection has been a subject close to my heart ever since I didn't manage to sell my own first novel last year. If you're interested, you can hear a little bit more about that in the intro to the first episode in this series. I'm excited to say that my guest this week is the actor, writer and conservative peer Julian Fellows. Julian is of course extremely well known for creating a little TV series you might have heard of called Downton Abbey. And that wasn't his first on-screen success either, having already won an Oscar for his screenplay for Gosford Park in 2002. Julian's had an eclectic career, also appearing on the long-running series Monarch of the Glen and a Bond movie. His accent, his family background, the subjects of class that fascinate him, all of these have sometimes led to people accusing him of being a snob, and perhaps people assuming that everything came easy to him. And yet... In the late 90s, despairing of an acting career that wasn't going so well at that point, Julian wrote a novel called Snobs, a book that looked at the flailing British aristocracy of the late 20th century through the eyes of a sort of outsider. He sent it out, and no one wanted it. In fact, some people said some pretty mean things. Several years later, after the success of Gosford Park, a publisher took it on, and it became a bestseller, as did Julian's two later novels. Just as I was talking about last week with the writer and editor Phoebe Morgan, sometimes it really is a matter of getting a book on the right desk at the right time. Believe it or not, Julian Fellows found rejection as hard as the next person, although he is, I think, an optimist at heart. We talk about that, about how people have always told him every project of his was unlikely to work out, and about the difference between putting something in the bin and putting it in a drawer. Here's Julian. You started off as an actor and um, as you moved to L.A. in 1981, I believe. How did you start writing? How did that come about? It came about accidentally, really, like practically everything else in my life. In about 1990, I think, I started to feel a slight need for a plan B, as one does in an acting career. Of course, paradoxically, the minute I slightly gave up on acting, my career improved enormously. And I set up a, um, with a chap called Andrew Morgan, a director, a little company, and we were going to make children's dramas to begin with. We tried to set up this thing called a Little Sir Nicholas. Then, I mean, this is a slightly unfair story, actually. I probably shouldn't tell it, really. But <laughs> we got some scripts written, and I didn't feel they worked, that they were really filmic. And we spent all the money. So by then, we need, if we were going to get any different scripts, we needed someone to do it for nothing. Mm. And I always remember one of the producers saying, what fool would do that? I was that <laughs> fool. And I, I wrote six scripts and they were filmed. And so they commissioned me to write a new version of Little Lord Fauntleroy. Mm. And that was very popular and won an international Emmy in New York. Uh, And then they commissioned me to write a new version of The Prince and the Pauper. Then that that phase came to an end because the head of drama at Children's changed and she wanted sort of the new one, wanted kind of drug running on the streets of Liverpool and not my (laughs) mixture of Kleenex and Christianity. And so (laughs) we were out really. But I then started working um, with someone called Eileen Maisel in getting scripts ready to be made into features. Uh, And I worked as an advisor and as a rewriter. And finally, she said, why don't you just do a draft of this yourself? And so I did. And from one of the scripts I wrote at that time, I wrote it for an actor, would-be producer called Bob Balaban. He was trying to set up a film with Um, Robert Altman uh, about an English country house and through some blessed and sacred chance all the writers they went because they went to all the sort of Tom Stoppard Christopher Hampton people 
And they all turned it down, which I still find very unlikely, given that it was almost certain to be Bob Altman's only British film, which is indeed exactly what it turned out to be. Bob was on, Bob Altman was on the verge of giving up. He told me all this later. Uh, and then Balaban said, well, there is this writer, and this is rather his bag, but you won't have heard of him because he's never had a film made. <laughs> and I was engaged in, in a sort of terrible international telephone call with Bob in sort of Texas or somewhere in Balaban in LA and me in Chelsea. Uh, and none and of us- were back in the UK by this time. Oh, I was back in the UK. Uh, anyway, uh, we had this conversation and I was asked if I would send out some character ideas. And of course, what I did is I thought, Altman is probably rather dubious about making a film telling the story of these people that he knows very little about, if anything, uh, and they're probably quite alien. And I bet he isn't, to some, because he, he was such a, um, I mean, he himself's whole career was a kind of piece of Americana. And uh, it, suddenly to be talking about an English country house, you know, in the 1930s. So what I did is I went out to the video, as it was in those days, the video library, and I got every Altman film I could find, and I watched them. I had a sort of three-day orgy of Altman films. That sounds really fun. <laughs> well, it was, it was fun, actually, but my plan was that he would receive my script eventually, and he would think, oh, I don't know, here goes nothing. And then he would open it, and he would recognise it as an Altman film. <laughs> the way it was constructed and the whole nature of the different narratives and all the rest of it would all be along the pattern of an Altman film, even though they would be very English characters. Mm. And, to, you know, to be honest, it worked. I mean, uh, what happened was that he, he went along with it. He told me afterwards he never, ever thought it would get made until he read the script. I mean, I now know much better than I did then how extraordinary that was. Yeah. Because, you know, I've had films made eight years after I've written them. Mm -hmm. And um, suddenly there was really almost no pause. And Bob, Ballop, uh, Bob Altman was an extraordinary law unto himself, really. I mean, he would announce that a picture was being made. We, we're, we're going to start shooting in the spring, you know. And in fact, th there wasn't any money. It, we didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And yet he would just assume that if he was confident and the whole thing was in the newspapers and it was a fact that the money would come and um, they did lend us the money. So in that sense, that was a happy story, if indeed a very chancy one. But my snob story is more about disappointment. Yes. I mean, just going back a little bit, you obviously started both script writing and and snobs at a time when you were, you know, you, you had been an actor and you, you'd had some success and you actually, as you say, you went back to acting when you were script writing and so on. How did writing, both script writing and novel writing, feel to you as compared with acting? Was, was it a more pleasurable, autonomous experience? Did it kind of tap into a different type of creativity for you? How did you find it? Well, acting is more fun, you know. I mean, there's all of you screaming in the makeup van or, or you're suddenly all together in some terrible hotel in Tripoli. You know, it's, it's, it's full of variety and you make these instant friendships. I mean, two days after arriving on set, you're telling someone the secret of your life that you wouldn't mention back home. You know, <laughs> all of that I enjoyed very much. I loved all that. And I was glad that I was successful enough that I never had another job. You know, I kept myself going through acting um, and I did do quite a wide variety of things. And I uh, was on stage quite a lot more at the beginning. And then I was on television quite a lot and I made a few films and so on. So all of that was very good fun. But of course, writing is your creation. I mean, you are very aware as an actor that if you can't do the job, they'll get someone else. I mean, there's not, there's not really some terrible grinding to a halt of the project. 
you know, they just look down their list and they try the next name. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you are the next name. <laughs> and um, the thing about writing is that it wouldn't exist without you. There's no question of just dialing the next name on the list. You are what you have written and what you have written is you. And that is a very different experience. Of course, um, it isn't always gratifying to contemplate it in that light. Uh, I mean, with, with my first grown up novel, I wrote some sort of silly bodice rippers when I was young and just out of drama school, but then I yes, didn't write I, anything I, for a long I time. I tried to look for them before, before this conversation and I couldn't find them. They were under the name of- um... Rebecca Greville was two right. of them. Yes. And then so you've Alexander written... Morant. And did you enjoy writing those? I did enjoy them because I wanted to prove to myself I could write something that got printed. Uh, and they all got printed and they did what those Robert Hale books were supposed to do. And I think were bought by sort of most care homes. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and that was it really. But much later, I decided I wanted to write a book in which I had something to say about the world I lived in and the, the person I was and so on. And I realized I lived to some extent in two secret worlds. One was show business uh, and one was sort of society, both of which are constantly written about, but very few people, proportionately, a very small percentage of people see them from the inside. And I felt that was maybe something worth exploring. Uh, and I have, well, as I'm sure a lot of people do, I have rather ambivalent thoughts about both. So anyway, I decided to write a book that was a real book. And the result was Snobs, which was not, as, not actually as autobiographical as my second novel, um, Past Imperfect, but nevertheless, it was very much drawn from my life. And yes, your narrator is is he he knows the elite, but he's not exactly one of them. And he is also an actor, and he he moves between these two worlds. And he's not and really he's successful, but he sort of jogs jogs along. Yeah, and uh, all of that was pretty truthful of me. And I think I tried to make it as well observed as I could, but it had initially. No success at all. No, my agent quite liked it, but she sent it out to all sorts of people. And quite a lot of people admitted to quite enjoying reading it, but they didn't think it had any future in publishing. And one quite senior agent who I'd known at Cambridge, we, we'd known each other a long time, and he said to me one day, he said, my advice to you, is to put this in the dustbin and write something grown up. <laughs> wow. So, okay, so I didn't put it in the dustbin, but I did put it in the drawer. And am I right in thinking that this is the late 90s? I, I've read somewhere that... This was the late 90s. That, this that was the late of these, 90s. Some of these and it went into a drawer and it sort of sat there. And in the meantime, because of these things, I'd written the film that became Gosford Park. And it then was made and it opened and I was nominated for an Oscar and I won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay in 2002. And of course, that generated quite a lot of interest, you know. Mm. Uh, and one was um, a letter from a man called Ian Truin, who worked at Weidenfeld. And he wrote to me and he said, I think I would like to publish a novel by you. Would you like to write one? Which, of course, is a dream opening, really. Yes. And, um, and I then met him, and I, I absolutely loved him. He became my publisher from then until his death, actually. Uh, and I really loved him. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I didn't know him at the beginning, and I... And I went to meet him. And the thing was, a lot of stuff had come out of the film and out of winning uh, the Oscar. So I was pretty busy and I was doing that and I was doing another film, I forget what. And I said to him, look, I haven't really got time to write a novel from scratch, but I have got this novel, which is written. And 
Obviously, it would need work, but I think I could manage that. The offer's there if you'd like to read it. He said, oh, yes, I'll read it. And he came back to me and he said, yes, we will publish this, but I would like you to do this and this and this. And, and for some time, we worked on it together. What he was an extraordinary chap. I mean, he never gave a note that didn't improve it. What did he ask you to change, if you don't mind? Well, just, he would say things like, we need one more beat in this before we reach the resolution. So you'd have to invent some scene or event or something that took up the character's time until they then came, because before it, you, they got there too soon, uh, and that kind of thing. Anyway, I did publish it, and it became a bestseller in Britain and America, and and. and quite a few other places as well, and has now been published in many, many parts of the world, and has never been out of print, actually. It's it's a wonderful book, uh, and um, as is Past Imperfect, which I've read several times, and I, I really enjoy that playing with memory that you do in Past Imperfect. Um, just going back a little bit, I wonder if you remember what the feedback was when Snobs was initially passed on by those editors. I read somewhere that because it was the late 90s, there was a feeling that this sort of new Labour Britain was not interested in these class examinations or something. Is that is that? Well, I, I, I've always had a bit of that all through my career, that what I was trying to do was out of date, there was no more interest. I mean, when Peter Fincham at ITV gave the go-ahead to produce and me to write a, a new series, which would be called Downton Abbey, <laughs> um, everyone said he was mad. They said the, the taste for period drama was dead. It was finished. He was wasting ITV's money. I remember with Gosford, which we I think most of the money for it came from America, but uh, there was one person we tried in London. I mean, we tried everyone, but and they scribbled on it, two like upstairs, downstairs, Altman is a nightmare. And that, that was the notes. Um, so I was pretty used to that by by then. And and in the end, I think you have to, I mean, this sounds rather vain, really, but I think you have to believe in what you're doing. I think you have to believe there is an audience out there somewhere for it if you can only get in touch with them. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, that, that has certainly proven to be true. I mean, we're now getting the second Downton movie. Yes, it proved, was proved to be true with that. But, but also with snobs, I mean, I found with Gosford and with snobs, a lot of people coming up to me in parties saying, well, I wanted to do it, but, you know, the others were against it and I couldn't bring them over and all that sort of stuff. And maybe some of them were telling the truth. You never know. When your editor friend told you to put it in the dustbin, were you hurt or, or do you just handle things like that very well? No, I think I must have been hurt because I never forgot it. I think if I just dismissed it, I would have forgotten it. But you and of course, every time I see him now, and I do still see him occasionally, every time I see him, I say, well, it's now a bestseller in 57 countries, you know, <laughs> just to kind of rub it in. Yes. But um, he believed, like others, that the taste for that stuff was gone, that the, the new Labour Britain was a different place, and it was all forward-looking and so on. Mm. Of course, it doesn't really make sense, that, because you can have a big hit in America with a period drama or a period novel. And America is a forward-looking place, much more forward-looking than we are. It just means there are some people who want this kind of stuff. And I've been lucky in that I have managed to connect with those people. Mm. And, and that's been fortunate. But I mean, yes, I mean, it was depressing. I mean, it had been turned down by about 20 publishers. And I put it in a drawer without any expectation of ever being asked to get it out. Yeah. But mind you, I think the story is useful because it does show you nobody knows everything. Or to quote William Goldman, nobody knows anything. <laughs> um, well, I think it's so interesting. I mean, lots of writers have novels in drawers, but you, in your case, that drawer novel actually eventually was published. And that is a fascinating story that, you know, it might not be the right time for something now, but oh, now it is the right time for something. Now it is the right time. Five years have passed. And if you just do it this way and that way, I mean, I repeat that I was fantastically lucky 
to have found Ian Truin, or rather for him to have found me. In fact, it was originally, I later learned, his wife, Sue, who went to the film with him and said, I bet this chap could write prose. Oh, really? And he decided to follow it up. Yeah. Um, so I owe her as much as I owe him. And um, I think in lesser hands, I don't think I would have had such a smooth journey. Yeah. Uh, and I worked with him on that. I worked with him on Past Imperfect. I worked with him when we did the scripts of the first three series of Downton. And, and you've written Belgravia, so you've written three novels as well as all your scripts. Do you find novel writing different from green writing? Yes, novel writing is just you and the editor. And you every now and then get into a huddle in sort of the Cadogan Hotel or something and you swap ideas, but you don't have this chorus of people who are entitled to give you notes. There's a lot of people in show business who don't have a particular gift for it. And the one thing they cannot do is keep stum when they are shown a script or shown a movie. They can't just say, yes, it's fine, mm. because then why are they being paid $750,000 a year? They have to come up with stuff but they don't know what to say. Usually there's two that are worth listening to and the rest are not. I'd seen her more as a blonde. You think, what the hell does that matter? <laughs> and there's a lot of that. But in film and television, you're, you're trying to hold on to your original vision before it's batted out of shape. The more successful it becomes, if it's a series, and it becomes more and more and more successful, then that in itself gives you more credibility. And so then fighting your own corner becomes much easier. But before it's ever been shown, it's, it's just you. It's you with a, a, a chair and a whip and, and standing in the corner. And, um, you, you know, you have to be quite uh, sure of what you want to do in those moments. And are you quite sure-footed as a writer generally? I mean, for example, when you were writing Snobs, which is obviously different because that was your first novel and you weren't even working on that with an editor, presumably. I mean, did yeah. you feel sure of what you wanted to do? Or were you were you kind of scribbling away in the dark hours feeling excited or were you sort of tortured by the idea of putting this all to paper? Um, I always try to reread after leaving a bit of a gap and I, I try to arrange, like I'll work on this episode and then I'll work on this episode for a bit. And then I'll go back and read the one before. I mean, it's interesting how some things you've done wrong are really quite glaring. And you think, how could I have thought that would do? It doesn't do at all. Mm -hmm. And you, you rewrite it. And I, I think I found, I, when I'd left Snobs for a bit and I came back and I thought, well, I don't know if there is a market for this, and indeed initially there wasn't. But I did think it was a truthful account of those people. I have found in my own life that you can sort of tell a truthful account, even when you don't know anything about the subjects of the book or the film, that when you see a monsoon wedding or something, you think, I bet this is, modern India is really like this. I bet this is a, something truthful in the way this story is being told, even though I, I don't know anything about modern India, but it somehow has a kind of ring of authenticity and truth. And that was really my ambition for Snobs, that when people read it, it would have a sense of being truthful. It does. And it, I think that partly comes from, I think that partly comes from the narrator being this outsider, which we've we've mentioned, well, a sort of outsider, because he's sort of relaying this. Well, he's an insider-outsider. Yes. And it's very difficult to describe. But when you, you know these people well enough for them to be quite relaxed and for you to be a friend, but at the same time, your life choices have been so different from theirs that you are a sort of object of curiosity as well. Do you feel like an outsider? Well, I'm a, I'm a sort of cross because my father was from one of those families, you know, and, and my birth is in Burke's landed gentry and all that kind of thing. But that wasn't my mother's world at all. My mother was the daughter of a sort of civil servant of no great shakes and who worked in the postmaster general's department. 
And she was uh, middle class, very good looking and very funny. So she, she got on in that way, but she didn't have any of those built in prejudices or, or automatic responses. She had her own responses. And so again, she knew some of these people, and I suppose through my father, she was related to some of them, but she never felt a kind of affiliation. I am probably more affiliated than she was, because after all, I am half that. Mm. But um, I think that is why I felt an insider outsider. I mean, for instance, my father's family, several members of my father's family were pretty awful to her because she wasn't what they wanted. And they sort of dismissed her, uh, which was very, well, very rude apart from anything else, but also it was unjust, but they couldn't see it. Mm. And I watched this when I was a child, I was puzzled by it. But as I grew a little older, I started to understand it. And, and I'm sure from that comes my rather analytical interest in class and what class does to people. Do you think it gives you a sort of resilience having always straddled that line between inside and outside? Yes. I mean, you seem like a very circumspect person when it comes to, for example, the rejection of snobs and so on. Is, is that, do you think that stems in some way from having always been alert to, you know, this possibility of not being completely accepted in some way? Yes, I think it might. I mean, also, I was the youngest child of four boys. I was the fourth. It's a very good idea to be a youngest child, unless there is a great inheritance, when of course it's a very bad idea. But, but when you're the youngest child, your parents have got bored with bedtimes and pocket money and all of these other routines. They just think, oh, the hell with it. But wait, wait till the end of the film. And so my childhood was much more indulged and relaxed than that of my brothers, which they resented, I can tell you. But I, it meant I grew up. Also, both my parents thought I would achieve something. And although very sadly they were both dead before Gosford came out, nevertheless, I think that sort of assumption that you're right to try for something extraordinary because there's every chance it may happen is a great blessing. You were 52 when, when Gosford Park came out. And I wonder if you had, I mean, you have all this sort of this feeling that, you know, your life's going to be fabulous and, and you'd had a good time acting, but not really, not really sort of become super famous or had a sort of, you know, the kind of glittering success that you have had since then. I, I wonder how you felt about that, whether you were beginning to worry or whether it bothered you. I mean, you seem so resilient, but I wonder if at that time, perhaps, perhaps there was, was a feeling that you know, oh, is, is this really going to happen? Am I going to have this sort of extraordinary success? In my 40s, I did start to have much more interesting work. I'd done sort of comedies and things in the West End, but suddenly I remember when I was 40, I think, I was cast by Danny Boyle in a leading role in a thing called For the Greater Good, which was very good. And I did start to think, oh, okay, now I'm going to have one of those proper character careers. But also when I was 40, I got married and I found that very much of a confidence boost. I think I was much, well, I was much happier at the most basic level. And then a year later, I was a father, I had a son and I loved that. I really enjoyed the first 10 years of my son's life were probably the happiest years of my life, I think. So I was quite happy all that time. Uh, and then Gosford arrived at the end of that. So I'd had a sort of happy decade of working quite a lot. And with, with Monarch uh, of the Glen, I had the beginning of a sense of being famous. It was the first time I'd had sort of taxi drivers shouting at me, when are you going to marry Molly, you know, and this kind of thing. <laughs> and um, so I sort of felt it was coming together. I mean, in a way, it was... 10 years late, but but they were 10 years that I had enjoyed. I don't know, we had a nice life. Mm. And, um, and that, of course, gives you a kind of confidence anyway, that you are uh, essentially enjoying your life and not lying there in a cold bath thinking, when is it ever going to start? I mean, which have, I had experienced in, earlier on. In the novel Snobs, you have, in which your narrator is an actor, you have another actor character who is is quite arrogant and also quite bitter when things don't go his way. 
And you you don't seem like that at all. And I find it interesting because clearly some people do find rejection and also the idea that in the arts, be it writing or acting, you know, success can turn on a dime. Some people find that very, very, very difficult. Well, I think I tell you what I think is very difficult and was true for the actor on which that character is based. Um, based on. <laughs> who shall be nameless. Um, <laughs> is that at the very beginning of his career, it was all going his way. He had a series, he had a series opposite a very famous actress. He was in movies, he was, everything was going great. And then gradually in that moment, when you turn from a promising newcomer into a young star, it just didn't quite happen. And I think that's very difficult. That wasn't my arc at all. I mean, I was told constantly, uh, it was a pity I wasn't trying 20 years earlier. Uh, my, my least favorite acting teacher at drama school, her last words to me were, stick to singing, dear. And, um, and I managed to get myself into rep and I managed to get myself into uh, a London play and I managed to find an agent after a lot of looking. And it was all a bit of a struggle. So any success at all seemed great, you know. I think I only had, I did have one year, which I've now sort of forgotten about, sometime around 87, 88, when I did get slightly desperate and think, jeepers, what am I going to do if it never gets any better than this, you know. But um, that passed, but um, it, it can be very, very bleak because there's no security, whatever. I mean, it's just none, you, you know, you're a vagabond. Uh, and that is very difficult. You've said that rejection as such doesn't really bother you. What, what does bother you, Julian? I think there is a kind of way of dismissing what I do with a, with a sort of contempt. And it's very difficult for them to say, well, this is well done and well produced and obviously must be affected because it's the most successful show that's ever come out of this country. But it's not for me. I personally don't enjoy it. And I don't agree with the values it appears to celebrate. Now, that's fine by me. I did, it doesn't bother me at all. But it's the being dismissed as a piece of trivial rubbish when you think, Think, but if I was trivial rubbish, it wouldn't be the phenomenon that's happened. And I don't think that's being vain. I think that is an, a realistic observation. Mm -hmm. But I do find that quite hurtful when people do it, which they do. I mean, your first book is called Snob Julian, and I, I think, you know, you, you have been accused of, of being that yourself, although interestingly, you know, that book is very much about, about exploring not being a snob. Yes, of it, course. It is interesting. I mean, I, I've read in another interview with you, 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 you um, quoted, I think it's Betty Davis, who said the actor who isn't typecast doesn't work. And I suppose that's true in some ways of, of writing also do you think it's do you think it's true of novels i mean what do you think would happen if you tried to do a different genre um a different genre i think i would find hard because i i did actually once try to write a kind of thriller uh, and it was about as thrilling as a victoria sponge <laughs> so i gave up on it i mean there is a skill that people have and you're absolutely on the edge of your chair uh, when you're reading it, and I don't have that. Did you share it to an agent I, or editor, or was that just you saying, no, this doesn't work? No, it was before, it was long ago, but I think I could write about modern people. I mean, part of past imperfect is, is modern, and I don't think I have to be in a world of footmen and panniers and things. I don't think that's necessary for me. But I think what I, I think what I think I have is a kind of insight into why people do things and why they behave as they behave. And I, I sort of feel that is in everything I write in a different form. I mean, whether it's School of Rock or, or uh, Downton, I think that underneath the obvious differences, you're looking at an analysis of why they make the emotional choices that they make. 
do you find it hard to write now having been so very successful does the pressure make it hard to actually put words on paper and I'm talking more I think about novels because they're quite a solitary activity where the sort of self-doubt can possibly get you a little bit more yes I think that's possibly true I I haven't written a novel for a while because I haven't really had time because these the thing about these series like Downton like The Gilded Age which I'm working on at the moment is that endless and you no sooner finish one year than they say well what about the next year and and there you are again faced with a mountain to climb you know and there is a a limited number of situations that human beings on the whole get into I mean before I was a writer I never understood why in dynasty it ended up with Fallon going up in a rocket ship with aliens now I understand. You're just trying to think, what haven't we done? Who hasn't been in love with whom? Is this what's and, going to happen in the in the Downton Christmas, the Downton 2 movie? <laughs> aliens. I don't think I was quite ready for Aliens. But, you know, you are trying to make the same eight situations or whatever it is new again all the time. And, and that is a big pressure. But I, I wouldn't say I really can't work. You know, I, 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 when people have a block and they literally cannot get past it, um, I just have to bloody well get on with it. You know, I, I, I've got a deadline and I'm trying to meet it and I'm usually slightly behind it. That is my normal position. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm pretty, well, it's dangerous to say I'm pleased with Gilded Age because the public haven't seen it yet and you you can never be too smug about anything until outsiders have watched it. Yes, yeah, so Gilded um, Age is, is an HBO show, which is a sort of American Downton. That's right, isn't it? It's a bit set earlier. Yes, it's set, it's set um, 30 years earlier in 1882. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know if I'm supposed to, but anyway, uh, mm. it's about... The, the two households, really, set in the period that came to be called the Gilded Age. I mean, the point of that is it is the Gilded Age. It's not the Golden Age. And uh, it, it's all about appearance. And, and that was the great status battle. And you had this battle that was being fought for the spirit of New York between the old families descended from the original settlers, and uh, Dutch and Scottish and English, and the new people who'd made these colossal fortunes uh, coming out of the Civil War, uh, as all wars produce fortunes. And um, they came to New York and they built these palaces instead of moving into rather modest houses in Washington Square. They built sort of Petit Trianon next to Balmoral, you know, all up and down Fifth Avenue. A lot of them have been demolished now. Uh, But if you walk up If you walk up high enough, if you get up into the 70s, you can still see quite a few of them. These two social groups sort of fought for supremacy uh, for a time. And that's really the background of the series, which actually tells the story of two families. Uh, And and, um, I've enjoyed it. I think we've got a very good cast. Because we were shooting in New York, we've used a lot of Broadway actors were marvellous. And of course, they, poor things, have had essentially a a year when Broadway has been dark. It sounds like you enjoyed the research for this one particularly. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. And and then they built these incredible sets, which I absolutely loved. Of course, the whole of Downton was shot on real locations, Mm. but um, it was easier for various reasons that we shoot a lot on sets and uh, I mean they really they were quite extraordinary uh, and that was fun I mean the difficulties of Covid filming of course the etiquette of Covid filming has to be experienced to be believed mm-hmm. you're always being tested and things are going up your nose and down your throat and god knows what and then you wear a mask and you, you have a coloured bracelet for if you can talk to the actors or if you can only be on set but you can't talk to the actors and yes. if you talk to the actors when they haven't got their mask, you must have a visor as well. And, you know, on and on it goes. Right. At one social dinner in when they took over the whole restaurant and it was me 
and the producer and two of the directors. And we all had our own table set separately around the walls. And so we spent the evening shouting at each other. And that was my one social event in the seven weeks that I was there. Just go back to Snobs for a second. I mean, Snobs came out in 2004, and that was a few years after Gosford Park. Um, but obviously you wrote it, as we've said, in the 90s. If, if, that, if your editor hadn't contacted you and asked you to write a novel, do you think you would have written another one? Do you think you would have written something else or tried again to get Snobs published? Was it, was it very important to you to be writing novels? It's quite hard to answer, really. I think it was important to me to write a novel in my own voice that wasn't tailored to a particular market or star or anything else. It was just my opinion, really, my observation. And that I felt, you know, important. I mean, is any of it important? But uh, I, I felt that was worth doing and that... Um, you know, to some extent that my great grandchildren could read my novels and know me better than they would have otherwise. But I was, I was deterred by the fact no one wanted it. I mean, when I'd written it, I thought it was rather good. Uh, and to receive, you know, nothing but rejections. And, it, and in fact, I'd love to tell you the rejections took a long time, but they came back almost by return of post. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, it was it was rather sobering, and I and I thought, well, maybe this is not my gift. I mean, I think you, that has to occur to you. There, there must be some part of you that says, if I'm going to live a full life, I've got to find something else to do. Uh, you can't just sit there dreaming in an armchair, waiting for your life to begin. Yeah. And uh, and I thought. By then, by the time, I, I would have thought by then uh, that maybe my gift was for dramatic writing, but not for narrative in the form of a novel. But do you think Past Imperfect might have, that you might have attempted something like that anyway with the desire to write that story? Well, I did have a desire to write that story because it was a very distinct phase of my life. And I sort of wanted to get it on paper. Apart from anything else, I had read in very many places that the season, the social season, came to an end with the end of presentation in 1956 or whatever it was, which is completely untrue. Mm -hmm. It went on long after that and really only died in the sort of 90s. And I thought I wanted to get all the detail of it down on paper, just in case someone was interested, the tea parties, the house parties, the, the lifts, the, the balls, all of it. And I thought that all of that was worth committing to paper, even if no one is ever interested in reading about it. At least somewhere, if there is a student in 200 years, they can find the book that tells them what happened. Yes. Uh, and that seemed to me worth doing. Yes, I did. I did want to write it. And maybe that would have been enough. I mean, I think you just have to bang on. Try to get, try to get people's opinions that you trust, who are not friends, mm. so that you're getting some kind of authentic opinion. If you can get some truthful opinions, and they say, no, there's definitely something worth working on here, there's something here, uh, then I think you just have to bang on, really, and, and not give up. I do think you have to write something else. I don't think you can keep trying to sell the same book that nobody wants to buy. You can come back to it when someone, when they bought something else you've written and published, it, then you can say, well, actually, as a matter of fact, I've got this book I wrote earlier. Um, I think that's fine. But to keep your brain sort of turning over, I think you have to write new things and try new things. I certainly don't think you give up because the first book doesn't get published. Hmm. What are you proudest of, Julian, in all your projects, from acting to film to books? 
I liked the film I wrote and directed, Separate Lies. Mm -hmm. That remains one of my favorites. And I thought the performances in it from Emily Watson and Tom Wilkinson were both absolutely marvelous. And mm -hmm. Rupert Everett, they were all great. Um, I like Past Imperfect. Uh, I like School of Rock. But I'm, you know, there are quite a few things that I like seeing again. I mean, I watched Gosford again the other day and I hadn't seen it for about seven or eight years. And I felt it had stood up well. Like I, you know, again, wonderful performances, which of course you're very dependent on if you're a screenwriter or a stage writer. But, uh, you know, I felt they were wonderful and they were wonderful actors. But I thought it had stood up as a film. I didn't feel I was watching a dated piece of old schlock, you know. It really stands up. It's very enjoyable on a rewatch, definitely. And last but not least, Julian, I can only ask you this since yesterday, but Downton the film too. I mean, can you tell us anything about it? What's Dominic West doing? It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I can't really tell you anything about it, except that it is happening and it's filming now, which they did say in the announcement. But it is, it's rather fun to round them all up again. I mean, we started in 2010, which is now... 11 years ago. It's, you know, it's rather extraordinary, all that. I think I've been jolly lucky, you know. I mean, don't give up unless you have no option. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Write Off. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you do have a chance to leave a review or rating, I'd really appreciate it. You can do that in your podcast app and it really helps people find the podcast. Plus, it just makes me feel good, to be honest. Guests still to come on the podcast include Anne Napolitano, Alex Wheatle, Michelle Roberts and Douglas Stewart. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Francesca Steele with an E at the end. So do pop along and say hello. Um, hope to see you there. Bye.